Mark chapter number 11. We begin reading verse number 15. The Bible says, And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying, Unto them is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it, and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. Let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for the good singing. Lord, we're thankful you touched us. Lord, we're thankful that heaven's just almost in view. And God, we're certainly thankful you took our place. Lord, we're thankful for the good testimonies. We're thankful for your people. On a cold Wednesday night, come out to the house of God, seeking your face. And God, I pray you'd meet with us in a grand way now through the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, we do pray for Brother Bob and Miss Lynn. You touch them. We pray for Brother Tony's family. I pray for any in that family that aren't saved. Lord, they'd come to the saving knowledge of Christ as a result of the passing of this loved one. Now, Father, I pray you'd comfort them and help them. Now, Father, there are others that have needs. I pray for them. Lord, I pray for the sick and afflicted. You'd touch them. Those that are providentially hindered, you'd help them. Lord, I know Caleb's not feeling well tonight. He's home. Touch him. And Father, we pray for those that are traveling. You'd give them traveling mercies. And Lord, now we pray for these in attendance and those that are watching, that, Lord, you'd give them strength from the Word of God. Enlighten our minds, challenge our hearts. Lord, draw us closer to Thee. God, God send revival in these days. As we heard, there are uh, folks looking around and asking questions about the end times. Lord, they're upon us. God, help us to shine as lights and point folks to you. And God, and we can't do that unless we're close to you ourselves. So God, do something in our hearts. Now, Lord, thank you for these thy people. Thank you for the blessing of being in the house of God. Now, bless this uh, uh, furtherance of this service as only thy can. And God, use this unworthy vessel and God, meet with us. And Father, we'll bless you and praise you for it's in the holy name of Jesus we ask it all. Amen. And amen. This is one of the familiar uh, stories in the life of Jesus. I want you to notice a few things, and we'll get to the thought. I want you to notice the rebuking. Verses 15 and 16, Jesus comes to the house of God. And by the way, any time it was uh, the Sabbath day, you'd always find him in the house of God. Uh, Jesus didn't take any Sundays or Sabbath days off, Saturdays. He didn't take them off. He was in the house of God. And in particular, this day, he goes to Jerusalem, and he finds that there are money changers there. There are folks who are selling sacrifices to take into the temple. There are folks carrying uh, vessels in the temple. Is that not what it says in verse 16? Look what it says. Uh, and he would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel uh, through the temple. Huh? I wonder what he'd do with that crowd brings coffee cups in today. Huh? Uh, I wonder what he'd do with that crowd bringing donuts in and that crowd putting their feet up on the back of the pews and folks uh, and cutting their toenails in the church house. Uh, you wouldn't believe what we find when you clean the church house. Uh, I wonder what he'd do today. Hmm? Boy, it's quiet. I'm, I, got a, I got a positive message. We got real quiet right there. Somebody brought some coffee in here, didn't you? Huh? I wonder what he'd do with folks who are checking their phones while church is going on. Hmm? I wonder what he'd do with that. Hmm? Well, hang out to the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to find out. Hmm? But notice he rebukes them. He makes a three-corded whip. He drives them out of the temple, uh, and he up to ends the, uh, uh, the tables. By the way, this, this really uh, flies in the face of that... Uh, a uh, uh, popular teaching that Jesus just loves everybody and wants you to come as you are. Hmm? He's not showing much love right here. Hmm? 
he's showing a whole lot of rebuke and he's straightening them out we see the rebuking now notice the reminding in verse 17 and he taught saying isn't that amazing he tears the place up and he gets up and he preaches to them hmm? uh, uh, that, that flies in the face of the preachers supposed to be welcome mats let everybody walk all over them and they get up and take it hmm? not him he got up and let them have it huh Look what he says. Uh, and he taught, uh, saying unto them, Is it not written? He's reminding them. My house shall be called of all nations uh, the house of prayer. But you made it a den of thieves. He reminds them what the house of God's supposed to be. Mm -mm. It amazes me how far we've come from the Bible. Uh, in recent years, They've done away with the pews and put in chairs so they can move the chairs out and they can play ball in the sanctuary. They can have Christian aerobics in the sanctuary. They can do everything but worship in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. They've taken the pulpits away. By the way, you know why it's called a pulpit, don't you? Because preaching is to pull people out of the pits of hell. They don't even preach on hell anymore. They've done away with the pulpits. Uh, they've done away uh, with the sacred things of God uh, and replaced it with uh, barroom facilities. Amen. You've got neon lights and you've got smoke machines uh, and you've got rock bands, uh, screaming guitars and all kinds of things uh, that sounds like the world and looks like the world and acts like the world. Uh, I don't remember if I had said this Wednesday night. I think I read it after that. Uh, but I, I, I read this quote kind of like it. Uh, it says that if your church starts looking like the world, uh, it's no longer a church, it's a goat farm. Yeah. Can I say, Jesus is reminding them that his house is to be the house of prayer. Amen. And yet... Many of them were the house of backbiting, the house of gossip, the house of tailbearing, the house of bitterness. Huh? Mm, you know what preaching will do? It reminds us where we should have been all along. We see the rebuking, we see the reminding. Now notice the, uh, the repudiation. Look at verse 18. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him. Now notice some things about this crowd right here. First of all, they're self-righteous. He gets up and he tells them truth. They don't like it. So the way they're going to handle it, let's get rid of him. Do you know how many people have gotten mad at preachers and sought to destroy a preacher? because they didn't like what he stood for. It's not been that many years ago, Brother Luther Spivey came through. How many of you know Doc? Brother Luther. Amen. Brother Luther came through, and, and I'll never forget, he preached on wintertime. And he said all the way up 75, he kept saying, no, not, not Emmanuel Baptist Church, not Emmanuel, Lord, not there, not this stern message for up there. And he got up here and he preached on wintertime and people getting cold, and people losing their fire, and losing the touch of God. And, and I mean, he just flat out shucked the corn. But if somebody here didn't like what he said, that person was here for another three years, and any time Luther's name come up, he tried to do everything he could to discredit Brother Luther. How many of you remember when we had Brother Luther in revival? This happened after that. And the first... Uh, 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 service was on Sunday morning and he preached for the first time ever even though he had said it for years I really get to go he preached on I really get to go to heaven and God showed up so big after that we didn't have preaching for the next three services I mean God just showed up and I mean God blew through here uh, I'll never forget uh, when he made us all come up close to the pulpit he just started looking at us and saying I love you 
I love you. I love you. Brother Clint broke out in a, a sweet, sweet spirit saying, him, oh, I'm telling you what, you could cut the Holy Ghost with a knife in here those three days. I mean, God just blew through here. I remember it especially well because my little girl got saved because of that Sunday morning message. Hmm? Amen. Now, I said all that to say this. The person got mad when he come up preaching on winter time had the audacity to tell me that God wasn't in any of that because God don't show up if you don't have preaching. I had to, I had to, to stop him. I said, you're in dangerous ground right here. I said, the Bible talks about blaspheming against the Holy Ghost, and you're getting real close to it right here. Huh? But what I'm trying to say is, people can get so cross when the truth is being preached that they'll do anything in their power to destroy the one preaching the truth. Mm -hmm. Trying to discredit. And, and just didn't like it because when Brother Luther was, was preaching on wintertime, he was shooting in that guy's, in that guy's uh, house. You know what I'm saying? Huh? He was parked in his driveway. <clears throat> and I got in like it. Hmm? You know what, to ha what you need to do when, when a message hits you? You need to get in the altar and do business with God. Mm -hmm. But see, these guys didn't like it. And they went about how they could destroy him. Why? Because they feared him. You know why people want to tear down a preacher? It's more than they just didn't like the message. It's because they don't want to do business with God over what the message was. They're afraid. It's called conviction. Mm hmm we see the rebuking, the reminding, the repudiated. They were self-righteous. They were sneaky. Listen, I wouldn't give you two cents for somebody that won't talk to you and look you in the face. You always got to worry about a crowd that's always working around behind the scenes trying to bring somebody down. The Bible says beware of those things that are done in secret. They were sneaky, and they were scared. Now notice the rattled. Look again in verse 18. We're going somewhere. You hang with me. It said that they sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him. Why? Because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. It amazes me there are preachers that they'll preach and nothing happens and then somebody else will preach and then they want to tear them down because that guy is somebody, God's using him, somebody's getting help. They feared him because of what he had to say and they didn't like it because people were responding to what he had to say. Hmm. But there were some, they were just rattled. They were astonished at his doctrine. Notice they weren't astonished that he, th he overthrew the tables. They were astonished at what he had to say. And I said, it's going to be nice. I'm not preaching on any of that. <clears throat> I'm interested in the rudiment or the foundation that Jesus is about ready to set forth. Look with me down in verse 22. And Jesus answering, he's talking to his disciples now, saith unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but he shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. We see that God, uh, the, the Lord gives a foundation that was going to be needed for their lives. It's a foundation needed for our lives. With God's help, I would just want to kind of teach a little bit tonight, give you a little thought tonight on how to pray effectively. There's a lot of people who pray and nothing ever happens. There's a lot of people ask God for things and they don't see things come to pass 
because they're not praying effectively. They're not praying the way they should. Prayer's more than words. Prayer's more than just a I lay me down to sleep kind of thing before you go to bed at night. Uh, prayer is a whole lot more. I'm talking about effective prayer. I'm talking about prayer uh, that reaches heaven and then heaven comes to earth. Uh, I'm talking that kind of prayer. The Bible says in James 5, 16, confess your faults uh, one to another. Let me stop right there. Didn't say confess your sins. There's only one person you confess your sins to. That's Lord Jesus Christ. But confess your faults. Uh, say, pray for me. I'm, ha I'm struggling in this area. Just pray that God will help me. Uh, 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 pray uh, 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 for me. I'm, I'm just not what I should be some days. Uh, 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 confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that we're commanded to pray one for another. Uh, but here's what I want you to see, that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Uh, uh, we can look in this world see it's a mess. Uh, we can look in churches and see they're a mess. Uh, we can look at homes and see there's a mess. Uh, uh, but what we need is some people who can effectively, fervently pray uh, and avail uh, much on earth uh, uh, from a hand of heaven. Uh, you realize you and I have the key uh, uh, to reaching heaven and we can touch in and tap into the greatest power there's ever ever been. Uh, the power that said let there be light there was light. Uh, uh, the power that said uh, uh, let this and let that and all creation came into being. Uh, uh, we're talking about the omnipotence of God is available to you and I. Uh, if we learn how to pray effectively. Mm, so many times we pray and we ask amiss. Or we pray and we really don't believe that God's going to answer our prayers. Mm, so let me give you a few things on praying effectively. Effective prayer, first of all, entails assurance. You're never going to see any mountains moved without assurance. Look again at verse 22. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus is hungry. Jesus goes to get uh, 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 some figs off the fig tree. There aren't any, and he curses it. On the way back through, the thing's dried up and dead. And Peter comments on it and says, That's the tree the master cursed. And that's why he says, uh, you can say unto a mountain, be thou cast in the sea, it'll be done. If you know how to do it. So first of all, it takes assurance. Notice what he said in verse 22. You'll miss it if you're not careful. And Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Now can I say that's, more than just believing God. It's more than just thinking about God. It's more than believing God can. And it's even more, Miss Mary, believing that God will. Having assurance means God that you know God will, not believing He will. You know. He will. So how do we get that kind of assurance? To have faith in God, you must have faith from God. Let me say that again. To have faith in God, you must have faith from God. That's the assurance I'm talking about. It's one thing for me to know that the Bible's true. It's another thing for me to believe that the Bible's true. To know that it's true, God has assured it in my heart. Every jot, every tittle, every promise is for me, uh, and God will perform them. Mm, my dear friends, when you ask having faith from God, you don't have to question whether or not it's going to come to pass. When you ask believing God can, there's some doubt. Now, how do you get this assurance? This faith from God comes through communion. It comes through having a constant, fulfilled relationship with God. How much do you commune with God? 
How much time do you spend with God? Do you remember when Jesus was praying? He says, Father, I know thou always hears me, but because of these around me, will you do it for their sake? Jesus constantly was going up in the mountain by himself to spend time with the Father. Jesus never prayed asking for something that he didn't know God was already going to do it because of the time he spent with God. He came to do the will of God, and while he was here, he was in constant communion with God until our sin was laid upon him. And my dear friends, if we're going to have faith from God, we've got to spend time with God. How much time do you spend with him? Hmm. I read something some time back that the average American home has a television set on for 10 hours a day. I'd like to really know how much people spend on this. Now, I didn't say television was wicked, and I didn't say this was wicked. Some of them little cat videos are cute, especially when they're hanging from a tree. They're in a pot in the Chinese restaurant. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> didn't say it was wicked, but it'll hinder your prayer life if you're not spending time with God. And if you've got time to do this, and you've got time to do this, you've got time to spend with God. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the effects of not spending time with God is why our churches are in a mess, why our homes are in a mess, why our country's in a mess. Assurance, faith from God, begins with communion. Then comes conviction. The more you're around God, the more you'll hate yourself. You'll hate your own humanity. You'll hate the filth of the flesh. You'll hate uh, 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 thoughts that run through your mind. You'll hate uh, 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 things that you say that you shouldn't have said. Uh, you'll hate uh, uh, looking at uh, what sin does to people and what sin does in society uh, and how sin affects things. Uh, you'll uh, uh, hate hearing about churches that are struggling. You'll hate uh, hearing about the devil uh, 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 bringing uh, 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 harm and shame people's lives and the families uh, 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 the more time you spend with God the more you'll get under conviction the more you'll realize you haven't arrived you know what the problem is the average Baptist church most people walk through the doors think they're okay you spend time hanging around God you realize how, how much farther you got to go friend mm. uh, the more time I spend with God the more time I realize how ignorant I am, the more time I realize how wicked I am, the more I realize how undeserving I am of His good grace. Yeah, Communion brings conviction. But can I say this? When you commune with God and conviction begins to rule in your life, then God will give you confirmation. God will give you a verse that will give you the assurance, that will give you the faith from God that when you ask, you know God's going to do it. So many times in the Bible, people prayed and acted upon their prayer because they knew God had already told them what He was going to do. Do you know why your prayer life isn't effective? You haven't spent time with God. You don't know what God's going to do. And Brother Donald, the time that people tend to want to pray the most is when the bottom has fallen out. Friend, it's not time to get close to God when the bottom falls out. You better already be close to God because I'm telling you, every day uh, uh, you and I are subject to something coming into our lives. Uh, man's days are few and full of trouble. Trouble's coming. Uh, storm clouds are brewing. Uh, you better be close to God. Uh, you see, effective praying 
begins with assurance. When God has given you something from His Word to assure you everything's going to be all right, friend, everything will be all right. You know why I didn't fret over cancer? You know why when Miss Annette told me I had cancer, she'll tell you I told her it'll be all right. You know why I, did, I knew that, Miss Mary? It wasn't because I was hoping it'd be all right. I knew it'd be all right. You know why I didn't cancel any of the meetings I had scheduled to preach that summer? Because I knew it'd be all right. You see, I'd already been with the Father. I knew it'd be all right. I'm not Superman. I'm not super spiritual. But when God tells you something, friend, you can bank on it. You don't have to waver. Hey, it'll be all right if he says it'll be all right. Uh, so Hezekiah's going to live another 15 years. Hezekiah dried up to tears and went on and lived his life. Got a word from God. Effective praying entails assurance. When you commune with God and God convicts something in, of, of your, in your life and you do business with God and you get to where you're seeking holiness and righteousness and then God shows you something from the Word of God and confirms it in your heart, friend, then you know when you ask. It's a coming. Effective praying entails assurance. Effective praying entails asking. Verse 24, he said, Therefore I say unto you, what so things, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe. When you pray, when you ask, he told us you have not because you ask not. When you do ask, you ask amiss because you don't have assurance on it. But friend, you're not going to get anything if you don't ask. Mm -mm. Takes assurance, but you got to ask. Did he not say that we as fathers know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more God knows how to give good gifts to his children? Huh? You just got to ask. Hmm? Listen, my youngins know if they need anything, if there's any way I can do it, they're going to have it. I've always known that. All they got to do is ask. I'll do without so they can have it. My dear friends, God did without. He sent His Son to die on Calvary so that we could have. Mm. Effective praying entails asking. Now listen, God don't want you to ask sheepishly. Oh, God. If it's okay... Will you meet my needs today? He told us to boldly come to the throne of grace. We might obtain help in time of need. Uh, Jesus boldly went to Calvary. Jesus boldly turned them tables over. Jesus boldly spoke the word of God. Jesus is our example. He never sheepishly did anything. Uh, hey, he boldly did what he was supposed to do. Uh, and he says to you and I, uh, Hey, if we're going to do anything for the cause of God, do it boldly, my dear friends. This ideology that Christians are supposed to be little wimpy, little sissified little fellows wearing skinny jeans and, you know, prissing around. That ain't, that ain't, that ain't being, that ain't, the Bible says quit you like men. It's saying be a man. God help us. It's a whole other message. Effective praying entails assurance, entails asking. Your father already knows what you have need of before you ask him. But he still tells us to ask him. You know why? Because we have to humble ourselves and depend on him. Effective praying also entails absence. Look what it says in verse 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, by the way, I don't see many mountains being moved. I have a lot of people call me and ask me to pray for them, but they ain't moving the mountains on their own. 
They expect me to do something that they can't do. You know why they can't do it? Because they don't try. They got more faith in me than they do the Lord. Friend, there's some things I can't help you with. But I can point you to the one who can. He said, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea. And here it is. And shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. You've got to be absent of doubt. Again, when you've got assurance from the Scriptures, and God gives you a verse on something, you can stand on that. Heaven and earth pass away, you stand on that verse God gave you. Mm-mm. But you, you start doubting and wavering. You doubt the power of God. You doubt what God said in your heart. You doubt the assurance He's given you. You doubt that God isn't bigger than your mountain. Your mountain's going to stay there. You've got to be absent of doubt. Friend, I don't care what it is. If God gives you assurance on it, you attack it. Everybody remember Caleb? I'm not talking about little Caleb around here. I'm talking about Caleb. Hmm. Caleb and Joshua went into the promised land with ten other jokers. The jokers come back and they're all scared. These Baptists. Well, we can't do it. It's too big. It's too big. The giants. And oh, oh, oh. Caleb and Joshua said, God said, it's our land. Let's go get it. Well, you know the story. Everybody listened to the naysayers. And as a result, Israel had to stay in the wilderness 40 years that that whole crowd died out. Joshua and Caleb got to go into Canaan land. By this time, Caleb's 80 years old. 80 years old. Brother Jack, stand up. Brother Jack's 84. He's our Caleb tonight. All right, sit down. We've seen enough of you. Sit down. No. 80 years old. Caleb looks at Joshua and says, give me my mountain. He said, I'm just as strong as I was when God promised it to me. And he took his boys, and you know what he did? He went up there and he, he took care of giants on his mountain. He got his mountain. No. You know why? He never doubted God. He just went after it. My dear friends, when God assures you something, you just need to go after it. Every day you stand and contemplate it, you start doubting. Just go after it. Hmm. You know, athletes that are the best are the ones that don't think about the game when they're out there. They just go play. Just go do what's natural to them. But when you stop and think about everything going on, you're going to mess up. So Christians get in that habit. We get to thinking about well, what are they going to say if I knock on their door and, 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 and they're not happy to see me? And, 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 and Well, they might be happy to see you. Why don't you knock on the door? God told you, knock, knock. God called, told you to call somebody, call them. God told you to give a track to somebody, give a track to them. Quit trying to overanalyze stuff and think about stuff and try and weigh what's going to happen. I don't want to offend anybody. Do you think Jesus was upset about offending somebody when he's throwing them tables around? He did what was right. And if God tells you to do something, that's what's right. Just do it. Quit worrying about whether or not you offend somebody. I promise you, listen, you're going to offend people. If you stand for this book, you're going to offend people. I'd rather offend them and tell them the truth than to watch them die and go to hell, never tell them nothing and their blood be required in my hands. I'd rather offend them than offend God. need to be absent of doubt. If you're going to pray effective, have an effective prayer life, it entails being in accord. Look again in verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever th- what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you... Receive them, and you shall have them. You've got to be in accord. You've got to believe what you're praying for you're going to get. That comes from that assurance we talked about. You've got to be in accord by aligning God's will with your desires. Notice I didn't say align your desires with God's will. Align God's will with your desires. 
it's always uh, uh, the will of God for you to pray the will of God. You've got to be in accord with Him. See, when you're in accord with Him, you'll know what to ask for. You won't pray amiss. And you'll know how to believe and not doubt. Because He's already given you assurance. But you've still got to align with Him. You've got to be in accord. Hmm. If you're not in accord with God, you're in a mess. But it amazes me that a lot of people pray for a lot of goofy things. Never knowing the will of God. Let me help you something. I'm going, to, I'm going to settle this right now because every five years it'll come up. Somebody will say, please pray for my little dog. He's sick. Anybody heard anything like that? God's not interested in your little dog. It's not the will of God to pray for your little dog. Tommy, how many you got now? About seven or eight? Yeah. Well, just pray God kills them, all right? <laughs> Let me help you something with your little dog. Let me talk to my little daughter-in-law. Chief don't have a soul. I know you think he does, and I know you think the world is, is revolves around him. You get a baby, you'll forget all about the dog, all right? All right? Uh, dogs don't have a soul. Don, your cats don't have a soul. <laughs> Natalie, all them guinea pigs you keep killing, they don't have a soul. Uh, Tweety Bird doesn't have a soul. God created animals for our good pleasure and for our good eating. Hallelujah. They don't have souls. God's not interested in little Fido or little Fifi or any of them things. He's not interested in that. You know what he's interested in? The souls of men. God's not interested in, in paying off all your debt that you've accrued. God's interested in the souls of men. Now, if God can get glory in working in your debt, that souls will get saved, God's liable to do that. But God's not interested in frivolous things, God's interested in keeping people from dying and going to hell. He's not interested in a little Fido or Fifi. So don't, if the next person that raises their hand and, and asks prayer requests for a little Fido, they're probably going to get rebuked from the pulpit, okay? Because God's not interested. That's not his, you know, the, there are people on the brink of spending eternity in the charred region of the dam. Jesus paid for their sin. Jesus loves them like He loves you and me. He doesn't want to see them go to hell. And Jesus has churches like ours uh, to be a lighthouse, uh, to be a red light on the way to hell uh, uh, that tells them they don't have to go. Uh, uh, he's let uh, you and I uh, uh, to work the jobs and live in the communities and meet people uh, so we can be a witness to them, a light to them, so they don't have to die and go to hell. Uh, we're to let them know what Jesus done for us and He'll do it for them. But people get all messed up and asking and praying and seeking things and they're out of accord with God. And when you're more interested and upset at your little darling dog than you are some wino under a bridge dying and going to hell, you're out of accord and agreement with God. Now that's popular preaching. Dad, you're welcome. I didn't get on your cats. I don't mess with his cats. His cat attacked me. I know they're evil. Y'all think I'm kidding. They was gone somewhere. We went over to feed the cat. We're going to help the cat. We're going to feed you, cat. Claws came out of everywhere on that cat, man. He, he, he tore my shirt, went all over me. Ned said, hold him still. I ain't holding him. I'm throwing him out the window, man. <laughs> Stupid cat. I didn't know the window wasn't open. You know, he kind of walks a little funny now. It wasn't good. Yeah, It wasn't good at all. I'm holding it as far as away, and it's still getting me. This cat's this big, man. It's got arms this long, man. I mean, it's... God wasn't in that cat, I guarantee you. 
You know why it got nine lives? It had about six, 6,000 demons in it. why. But you see, our thinking has gotten so shallow because we don't spend enough time in the Scriptures. And we get attached to things that don't matter. What God's interested in is eternal things. Things that do matter. And your prayer life will become effective when your prayer life is based on eternal things. Really. A hundred years from now, it ain't going to matter where you lived. It ain't going to matter what you drove. It ain't going to matter how much or how little or where or what. None of that matters. What's going to matter is what you did for Jesus. Friends, prayer is where the power comes from. Prayer is what's missing on in our individual lives and our corporate church life. Prayer is where revival will come. No great move of God has ever came without prayer. And you and I can't have that power unless we learn to pray effectively. And can I say it's God's will for revival to come? We need to get assurances on that and start praying for God to perform His will in our lives, in our church. The last thing that I find to have an effective prayer life, as taught by Jesus in these verses, is it must have acquittal. Look with me, if you will. Verse 25. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Your prayer life can never be effective if you have unforgiveness in your life. So if you have an aught with anybody, you forgive them. Notice it didn't say, Wait till they come and ask for forgiveness. See, your prayer life hinges on whether or not you have forgiveness in your life. Now, Brother James, forgiving somebody doesn't mean that I condone them. Doesn't mean I agree with them. It just means that I'm not going to let whatever they did to offend me or harm me or hurt me harm my prayer life. So I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to say, Lord, have mercy on them. Lord, uh, uh, I forgive them. I don't want to, anything to hinder my prayer life. Uh, I'm going to forgive them. Uh, I'm going to let them know that I've forgiven them. Uh, and I'm not going to allow anything from that situation to cause bitterness, hurt, envy, jealousy, anything to enter my life that's going to hinder my prayer life. I believe if you forgive somebody, you start praying for them. You start praying for the blessings of God in their life. You pray that God will do something in their life. Hmm, You've got to have an acquittal. Because if I don't forgive them, God's not going to forgive me. And the Bible's real clear. If I harbor iniquity in my life, God won't hear my prayers. And so if God's not forgiving me, that means i got something in my life. And it's hindering my prayer life. A lot of people can't get their prayers through to heaven because they're full of bitterness, full of anger. They got unforgiveness in their life. You want the blessings of God, but yet instead of blessing people, you'll bless them out. You'll figure that out in a minute. Some of you are mad at your boss because you didn't get a raise. Some of you are mad at your spouse because you don't pick up his dirty laundry. Well, he's a man. You got to tell him to pick it up. He ain't going to see it. He's a man. The only thing he's looking for is the remote. Uh, some of you are not careful get upset at one of your church family members. They didn't shake your hand. Well, they probably thought you had COVID. Or they watched you wipe your nose with your hand and reach it out to shake. I ain't shaking your hand either. 
You go to the bathroom, you don't wash your hands. I ain't shaking your hand. Uh, you're nasty. So I ain't shaking your hand. But I love you. Bless your heart. See, if you say bless your heart, it's okay. Mm -mm. There's a lot of people. Just a little bitty thing. Just a little splinter. Will cause unforgiveness in their life and hinder their prayer life. Now listen, let me say this. If you read these verses, verses 20 through to 25, faith and forgiveness are the two ingredients for an effective prayer life. He deals with faith and he deals with forgiveness. To exercise these ingredients, it takes devotion. You're not going to have an effective prayer life just praying once a week. It takes devotion. It takes time. It takes work. You know, we we've so bought into this instant gratification. You know, most young ladies aren't taught how to cook anymore. They're taught how to microwave. They're taught how to drive through. Or DoorDash. Who's over working on Sydney's condo, and every night there's about 60 DoorDashes. Everybody in that place is DoorDashes. You know, people DoorDash it, have it delivered in a box. Hmm? Gone are the days where you put in some flour and you roll out the dough and you put in a little bit of this and a little bit. Don't ask me. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm ignorant when it comes to the kitchen. But I know the difference between homemade and nuked. And don't give me any of that lip that frozen pizza is as good as going down and getting it at the restaurant to hogwash. Frozen pizza tastes like cardboard. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. I'm sorry, Donald. Is that all you get is frozen pizza? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, bro. Sore spot, sore spot. I'm sorry. You know, I, you know, that Geno stuff, it's okay, man. It's just, Somebody get him a La Rosa's coupon so he can have some real pizza. Uh, but see, when you exercise faith and forgiveness, you'll have an effective prayer life. But it takes devotion. It takes working on it every single day. It takes discipline. You see, the old timers... Knew a whole lot about God. Now listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. They didn't know, necessarily know a whole lot about the Bible. If you were to ask an old timer 50 years ago, explain to me what eschatology is, they'd look at you like you're crazy. Are you speaking in tongues? Eschatology is the study of the end times. And if you ask them to expound on the great tribulation period and the millennial reign and all these things. They may have knew, known the concept, but they couldn't have expounded a whole lot on it. But you know what they could expound on? The power of God. You see, the old timers believe you stayed in the altar till you got assurance from God. They used terminology that the charismatics jumped on, but I'm talking about before the charismatics. They used terminology like praying through. You just didn't run there and lay your petitions down to the Lord and get up and, and catch the last two verses of the invitation song. You grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar and you stayed there till God gave you assurance. You prayed through. In other words, you came to the end of yourself and then God took over. And that takes discipline, friend. Because our mindset is geared to Got to hurry, got to hurry, got to hurry, got to hurry. Now the restaurants don't have any staff and they close earlier. Got to hurry, got to hurry, got to get here, got to get there, got to go to Walmart, got to do this, got to do that, got to do this, got to do okay, Hurry, 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 hurry. And we've gotten so much in a hurry, we don't know how to wait on God. It takes discipline. God don't care what time Walmart closes. God cares about the souls of men. 
takes devotion. You've got to love God and love the things of God and love the souls of men. It takes discipline that you're going to put God first. And then it takes being duly authentic, genuine, real. If there's an indictment of this age on the church, it's this, that the church is full of hypocrites. Because when they look, they don't see many real Christians. Even some of you tonight, your motives are questioned. Because people don't know if you're real. If you're authentic. Or you just want to be seen. Or you just want to be heard. Or you just wanting a little backpack, a little glory. You can tell when people are real. I worry about that crowd when, like the Apostle Paul, when he said when James and John seemed to be pillars. They said the right things, they looked the apart, but they just something wasn't right. I don't want to be one of them. I had to preach the hardest message I preached in a long time down there at Brother Greg's this week. But they received it because they knew I loved them. They knew I was real in what I was saying. Friends, faith and forgiveness, when you're authentic, it's natural. It's natural. You know why some of you can't cook like Grandma cooked? Grandma didn't have the recipe. She just knew a pinch here, a little pat of this, a little bit of that. She just knew how to do it. Some of you are trying to follow the recipes. You got it all laid out. But you're missing a key ingredient. It's not coming from your heart. When you're real, it comes from your heart. You want to see revival? You want to see our church turn around, our community turn around? You want to see your loved ones get right with God? You want to see a great move of God in these days? Learn the secret to praying effectively. Have faith in God and that faith comes from God let God birth something in your heart through your prayer life that changes you and so doing will change those around you say this and I'm done I had a book the autobiography of praying Hyde started reading that book it was back before we had Jordan Net come walking by my den she says what's wrong with you I said that book's what's wrong with me I said I've learned that I've never prayed after reading about praying Hyde this man prayed so intensely and so often that his very heart became dislodged it was moving in his chest because of the anxiety and the, the, the pressure of his prayer life was putting in the cavity of his chest. Doctor said, if you don't quit praying, you're going to die. He said, glory. He kept praying. He went to his prayer room after it was over, after he died. And by the way, he changed India, changed China through his prayer life. He went into his prayer room, and there were two knee holes caved out of the floor where his knees were. He prayed. He touched heaven. We can't touch people until we've touched heaven. 
God help us to learn to pray effectively. I'm done. Let's all stand, Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. Folks are coming. Let's pray. Father, Everybody wants the secret to revival. Everybody wants to see a stirring of God. Everybody wants to see loved ones saved and get right with God and waywards come home and community changed and our country changed. Lord, the secret is prayer. Effective prayer. Effectual, fervent prayer. God, forgive me. When I rush in to the prayer closet, rush out. Forgive me when I've been idle and not fervent in prayer. God, help us to take to heart the truths of tonight's message. Help us not to seek anything but Thee, Thy power. God, help us to impact these days through prayer. Bless your people. Lord, convict them when they're not praying. God, grant them the discipline and devotion it takes to be effective in their praying. God, grant us assurances. God, give us faith to know what thus saith the Lord. God, transform us to be like Christ. Then God, transform our world because of Christ. Oh, how we bless you, Father for winking at our ignorance. We bless you, Lord, for mercy instead of justice. Bless now, Father. Help your people. Breathe life into them. Oh, God, meet every need they have that they might more effectively shine for thee. We'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' holy and glorious and deserving name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.